We have a new song that we want to sing for you this morning. And it's got a good message to it. I like what it says. It's, but I, I, it's one of those that's lively. And so you need to clap with it almost. I mean, it just helps to clap with it. So if, if you want to do so, uh, go ahead and clap on this song. Uh, it'll probably even make you feel better if you can clap on it, okay? God's love is an everlasting love. In Psalm 63, it tells us, Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. Let's praise him today.
Thank you, choir and orchestra. Ernie, you came through there today, didn't you? Good. Enjoyed that. Well, it's summertime. Glad to have some of you back from vacation. Some are on vacation today, but uh, some of you are not only back from vacation, but some of you have been in the hospital and you're back, and we're glad to have you. And we've been praying for you. We still have some people that need our prayers and in the hospital. Look at the prayer request as you go out this morning. Well, I don't know what happened to uh, all the little uh, demons or minions in uh, the service today and in my sermon outline. I opened my bulletin this morning and found out I was preaching from uh, Isaiah 53. And it's not 53 at all, it's 35. <laughs> and uh, how that happened, I don't know. Uh, I do the typing, but sometimes uh, it's early in the morning, 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning. I ask the office to always proofread everything because uh, apparently I'm not awake all the time. I could say I'm inspired, but uh, uh, the Holy Spirit never makes a mistake. So it is from Isaiah chapter 35, the first four verses. Uh, this chapter has been described as a messianic chapter. You probably saw I brought some props today. You love my props, don't you? Last week it was money. Not uh, my money, your money, but our money. Uh, did you keep that money? I, I needed that Monday morning to know that I, my trust was in the Lord. Uh, somewhere along the way, I got busy that week, and I kept it in my pocket, and I spent it. But I had another dollar bill, so I got it out, and I just kept it as a reminder that in God I trust, in God we trust. The Messianic chapter, let me describe it this way, and that's why I have the cross. Excuse me. Excuse me, cross, I guess. <laughs> Messiah chapter, Isaiah is talking about things that would be when the Messiah came. You get the idea? It's before the cross. And sometimes we need to realize the, the setting of the scripture, particularly when it talks about promises and covenants. Much of it was written before the cross. So the Messianic chapter that we're going to read from today is talking about when the Messiah comes. When the Messiah comes. These things will happen. Looking forward to the cross. And then later, as we would read uh, from Paul or Peter, they look back to the cross because the cross has already happened. So the Messianic promises have already happened. And so they live in those promises now because the cross is behind them. Before it was looking toward the cross. Now they look back to the cross because of the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. These things are true. And these are the benefits that we can live in even now. And so many of us do not take time to live in those benefits because we forget that the Messiah has come and the prophecies have been fulfilled. Not one prophecy was left unfulfilled. So to honor the word, if you have your scriptures, would you stand please and let's read. It's Isaiah chapter 35. Again, the children of Israel are in the wilderness. The title of my message this morning is uh, How to Do Life and Remain Strong. Or I think on the internet I said uh, How to Live in the Fast Lane and come, all, come Out Strong. Now I know most of you are not living in a real fast lane, but time is ticking. So compared to the time where you are and the sunset, it's a pretty fast lane. It's like the toilet paper. 
near the end, the faster it goes. Guy last Sunday said, yeah, just change the paper. But uh, in life, we can't just change. We can get some extensions, but it's a fast lane. I hear some of you say you're retired and you don't know what you do all the time, but you stay so busy. I am beginning to learn what you do in these years. You go to the doctor. <laughs> go to the doctor. And you keep a calendar so you'll know when it's time to go to the doctor. The rest of us, we need a little time clock to tell us, take our medicine, take our medicine. Put the drops in the eye. You know, take your AM medicine, take your noon medicine, take your PM medicine. It's a fast lane. But how can we come out strong? Well, just a little more background here. You see, the children of Israel were living in the wilderness. But since the cross, we don't have to live in the wilderness. There's a unique thing or two about what I will read to you today and share with you that even in the midst of the the children of Israel's wilderness, there was a Lebanon, and I'll explain that. And there was a, a Canaan or a Carmel and a Rosa Sharon. I'll explain that a little bit to you. But the writer here says, the desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the carcass, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and, sh and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon, I have Lebanon uh, underlined in my scripture, will be given to it. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strength of feeble hands. If you underline your scripture, and I'll come back to hands. Steady the knees, I'm gonna come back to the knees, that will give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, I underline fearful hearts, be strong and do not fear. Your God will come and he will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. Amen. The Israelites were looking forward over in 2 Peter chapter 2, Peter is looking back for what the Messiah has already promised. The children of Israel were in the wilderness in Isaiah's speech. It was a wilderness dry and hard. It was a hard time. Uh, this message could be for you and you might need to lean into this message if you're going through a wilderness experience. Can I be honest and transparent? Not many of us live very long without a wilderness. We all go through a wilderness, a dry time, a dry and barren time, when it seems like God is far removed from your circumstances. If you feel that way, lean into this message, engage in this message, because you can come out strong. If you're going through a wilderness experience, and if you haven't been through one recently, I'm not a pessimist, just a realist. There is a wilderness ahead for you. And it may not be as quite as dry and barren as the past ones have been, if you will listen to what the writer to the children of Israel had to say. And you know, we have been grafted into the children of Israel, don't you? We are part of God's forever family as believers of Jesus Christ. We have the covenants, we have the benefits because of the cross and it's empty. You see, it's interesting that even in this wilderness, and I'm just giving you a little background here, there was a Lebanon. It uh, today is still there. It's a fertile land in the midst of a desert it had fertile land, it had uh, good trees. Carmel is literally known as a garden land. It referred to in, in verse two, God put Adam and Eve in a garden. And even in the wilderness, God provided a garden 
for the children of Israel. He provided at Lebanon. God always provides a source of strength, of comfort. A Lebanon. You need to find it. That's an oasis in the midst of a desert. That's an oasis, oasis in the midst of our weeks when we're traveling fast. Uh, do you ever stop at a roadside rest stop? The older I get, the more often I need to stop by that place. I'm sure you don't, but uh, I do. It's sort of a, a welcome place, isn't it? You get out to stretch and do whatever else you need to do and walk the dog. And uh, There's always a rest stop for us when we're traveling on the highway of life. It's a welcome rest spot. You have to look for it. You have to be sensitive to it. But God's got a Lebanon. He's got a, a Carmel for you. He's got a garden. You know, it all started in a garden. It's interesting to me that Jesus, after his resurrection, what did he do? He appeared to Mary where? In a garden. Now, those of us who live in Florida, we think we live in a garden. It gets pretty hot sometimes. We don't know about the cool breeze so often, but I believe God has a spiritual garden for us to live in, even when we travel the fast lanes of life. If we'll take time, that's why we need the church. That's why you need a personal development time in your spiritual life, quiet time. Well, I'm ahead of myself. Isaiah 3 and 4 says, in 35, says, Strength the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, Be strong and do not fear, your God will come. Would it be all right if God would strengthen you today? Amen. Would it be all right if he would strengthen you every day this week? If you'll lean into him, you can find a Lebanon, you can find a Carmel. Even in the midst of the fast things of life, there's some rest stops. And don't forget that God has provided these for you. Well, three things I want to point out to you today rather briefly. Hands. I think that refers to what we do. Throughout the Old Testament, New Testament, talks about hands and, and just hold your hands up. Have you ever had one of them disabled? It's so awkward to have one that's disabled. What if you have both of them disabled? You're pretty well dependent on others. But do you realize all the things you do for, with those hands? It's things we do. Well, I think God wants to strengthen us with our hands. I want to apply this particularly to the element of worship. Because that's really what we're called to do, is to worship. The choir, Walt, led us in worship today, challenging us to worship God. And one element of worship that we don't pay too much attention to in the Church of the Nazarene is worshiping Him with our hands. What do you do when you go to a ball game? Yeah, yeah, you got it. And when the pastor asks you to raise your hands in church, this is the way Baptists raise their hands. <laughs> A Nazarene does well to get it this way. Sort of looking around to see. Well, maybe I better take them down. But I think what God really wants us to do is to do this. Because when I lift up my hands, I am out of control. I can't control much up there. My hands are open. I'm very vulnerable. You could do a real gut punch on me right now, couldn't you? 
I've seen a few people that wanted to do that. <laughs> but if we really would worship, and if I could just take it a little bit further in the scripture, uh, Nehemiah 8, chapter 8, verse 6 says, All the people lifted their hands and responded. And when they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Psalm 63, verse 4, Lamentations 3, 41. Lift up your hands. Lift up your hands and heart. Some of them say, well, I don't lift my hands up, but I lift up my heart. Well, Lamentations says, lift up your hands and your heart. We don't understand our prayer life based on the Old Testament. You say, well, we're not in the Old Testament. And I'm thankful for that. But there's some things that are principles there that indicate a human response. I, you know, I behave in church about the same way I behave at a ball game. I go to a ball game to eat hot dogs and peanuts. The game is just incidental. It's a good excuse for hot dogs and peanuts. And everybody's up and shouting and loud, and I'm sitting eating my hot dog. Maybe they'll knock off my Coke. And so I pretty well do the same thing, except eat hot dogs and peanuts in church. Some days I'd like to have a hot dog. <laughs> but the way you act in church ought to be a reflection of how you act in a ball game. How do you act uh, when you watch Judge Judy? You give her a piece of your mind and you talk to the television and uh, our Jeopardy. I know most of you can't do a lot of things during the daytime until you have a schedule of Miss Judy. Our Jeopardy, our, what's the other one? What is it? Oh, yes. I knew all of you knew Wheel of Fortune. I just wanted to figure out who of you watch Wheel of Fortune. What do you do with your hands? I hope I'll encourage you to lift up your hands in worship. Don't be a reserved Baptist. Presbyterians, this way. Assembly of God, I'd like for us to be more like the Assembly of God in many ways. Well, let's go on to knees. It gets worse than hands on the knees. I think knees refers to prayer. If we would walk in the power of our prayer life, now I know that some of us cannot longer kneel. I've watched some of you kneel for the necessities of life, uh, picking up stuff, or, but you say you can't kneel to pray. Whatever I can do in ordinary life, I should be able to do in my prayer life. I don't ask you to do what I do, but could I just give you some insight? One thing I got for my birthday, I wanted a new prayer rug. I'm not uh, of an Eastern religion. But I have wooden floors now in the parsonage. <laughs> and I have two new knees. And so I needed a padded prayer rug beside my bed because before I start the day and before I end the day, I want to get on my knees. You don't have to do that. That's just me because I want to humble myself before God. And the best way I know is to get on my knees. If you prayed like the Old Testament folks did, they lay prostate. If I could, I'd lay down here, but I might not get up. <laughs> but that's how they prayed. And they spread their hands out. Well, you may not be able to kneel but you should find a, an attitude of kneeling, humbling yourself. 
And when you kneel, you sort of lay it all at his feet. Now, many of us are sort of like this in our prayer life. I have some, another prop here. This is my backpack. I never know how to wear it. I've tried it every way. And people have tried to adjust it. It still doesn't fit. I think it's too small or it's too big. But this is sort of like the burdens of life. They don't fit. I have a lot of stuff in there. And when I travel and take my backpack, I have important stuff in there. I have the realities of life, bills to be paid, important documents, and I have a Bible. But you and I sometimes take this as a burden, and this represents a burden in my message today. And we say, okay, Lord, uh, I'm, I'm going to leave it with you. And I let go of it. It's there. And so I go on my way for an hour or two or maybe hours. And uh, something reminds me that uh, I still am concerned about my burdens. And if I'm not careful, I, I go back and I say, well, God, if you're not going to do anything about it, I'll just pick it up again and try to carry it on. Don't we do that? If it didn't happen instantaneously, if it didn't happen in an hour or two hours, or if it didn't happen in a day or are seven days. Instead of leaving it there, we say, okay, I'll put it on my back and carry it on. And I go on my way. But you see, God wants us to do something differently. Let me give you this illustration. Proverbs 16, verse 3 says, Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will, what? Establish it. Can I tell you what that word commit means in, in the original language? It means literally to roll over. Roll over. The context of it is that, and I don't understand this about camels, but they would always put the heavy burden on one camel. They said that with the burden on one camel, the, the rest of the herd could travel faster. I don't understand that. The one that has the heavy load takes about uh, four to eight gallons of water before they have to have more water. And they tell me, according to history and uh, the study, that when this camel has gone as far as it could go, it would kneel down and roll over. And that's where the word commit comes from, roll over. They would pick up the, the burden the camel rolled over and place it on another camel. Again, I don't understand why just one. They said they could travel faster. But the idea is that we roll over our burdens. So when you come to the cross in prayer, roll over. Let God take the other side. There's a third word, hurriedly, heart. The writer to the children of Israel talked about the heart being fearful, but said, be strong and do not fear. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he, the Bible says. I think it refers to the very center of life. Joshua 1 verse 9 says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be afraid? Joshua heard these words seven times. Three times from Moses, three times from God, and then one time David said that. And even Paul echoed this in the, in the New Testament, chapter 2 of uh, 2 Timothy verse 1. Talked about... Be strong and courageous in your heart and don't be afraid. In other words, fix your words that reflect your heart is at ease. Let your mind and your heart be at ease. 
the, these are symbols in your hands and in your heart. Turn it all over to God. Uh, the psalmist said in verse 1 of uh, chapter 11, no, excuse me, 119 verse 11, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not what? Sin against you. Tremble and do not sin. When you are in bed, look down, deep down inside your heart. And the better translation of that is to meditate. Means to think on it. And if we would just fill our heart with the word of God and live out the word of God in our heart, let it be a, a wellspring of everything that we do and say. We could travel in the fast lane and come out strong. Your heart, without your heart, you're dead. You can live without a lot of other organs in your body, but when the heart gives up. And so guard your heart and you can come out strong. Learn how to praise the Lord in worship. Next time, just lift your hands a little bit more. Move from the, the Baptist to the Pentecostal and find your place in worship. Find a place that is a quiet place of prayer. When I'm not kneeling in prayer, I like to be in my easy chair, just me and Jesus and a cup of coffee and the word. Summary, you can sing and not worship. You can pray and not commune with God. You can read the Bible and not really drink in the living water. I want to send you home with something today. Ushers, if you will, I have a fork for you. I know some of you don't have forks at home. Times are hard. You probably are ahead of me. You know why I want to send a fork home with you. Because the best is yet to come. And come, gentlemen, if you would. I want everybody to take a fork. It's a tangible way, just like the money was tangible last week. I want you to keep the fork somewhere and just pass them out like you're taking up an offering, except let them take from the offering plate today instead of putting something in. You say, that's a crazy idea. Yes, most of life is crazy, especially when you're living in the fast lane. But you can come out strong if you'll remember the best is yet to come. You know the story behind that, don't you? I'm a southerner. I've had many southern meals. And they usually say, keep your fork. You know why? Because the best is yet to come. The dessert. And wherever you are in life, it may be tough. It may be tough to chew on. Your diet may not be good. But leave the fork around somewhere this week to remind you that the best is yet to come. God does have deliverance for you. God has peace for you. He has a garden for you. It all started in a garden. You can live in a garden now, even in this world, because let not your heart be troubled. Believe in me, believe also in. For in my Father's house are many mansions. So uh, when you go home today, if anybody asks you what the preacher talked about, what are you going to say? A fork. And what does that mean? Uh, you're hungry. <laughs> and I trust you're hungry for the word. You're a great crowd. A little humor on the hot summer day, but uh, it's a fast lane, isn't it? But you can come out strong. Laid to rest, one of my best friends this week. You only have, they say, five best friends. I laid to rest one of my five. It was tough. 91, soon to be 92 years old. 
he was my friend. I tried to be his friend. Impacted my life like perhaps no other. Uh, the best was yet for him to be. He's in heaven today. And the family rejoiced. Would you stand and lead us, if you would, the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father. May grace and peace be to you in fullest measure. And God's people said, Amen. God bless.